in as we go. Welcome everybody to HMS Psyche's virtual training for piping aboard. Glenn and Hobie here is going to give us a great introduction of this very formal ceremony uh, utilized for when a senior officer comes aboard ship. And uh, this, this has lasted the test of time since uh, at least the 18th century. So um, welcome, and I'm very excited about uh, having Glenn, Glennon give us this talk. Uh, a couple of administrative points. Everyone's going to start off on mute, and uh, we're going to go through the presentation. You can put your questions and comments into the chat, and that, and then when when Glennon is uh, finally orally exhausted, we're going to open it up for questions. So I will click a certain choice button. Of words. <laughs> I'll click a certain button and then you'll be able to manually unmute yourselves. But remember that you do have to mute, unmute yourself to speak. I can't unmute you for you at that point. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Glendon. Uh, good evening, everybody, and, uh, and the cat too. There's more than one way to... Anyway, uh, tonight's topic is piping aside. And I just got to get my face off here because I got too much face. Except I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Anybody know how to do this? Did you do this to me, Ryan? I, I okay, have I've the, made the, uh, I've spotted lighted your. Yeah. You sure you want that? Yes. Okay. Uh, piping aside, that goes back at least to the 16th century. Uh, different forms, no one's really quite sure, but it seems like it's one of those things that's been done forever. Uh, my main focus, of course, is going to be the early 19th century, uh, from which most of the traditions have remained intact up until now. There's a few things that have changed. We'll talk about those too. Uh, as we go over it, I'll give you a little history. I'll tell you who's entitled to be piped aboard. Um, something about the drill, because there is drill involved as well. Uh, the orders given, the reason that the call is so long, or the pipe is so long, Positioning of the piping party. How many times you give a pipe upon the arrival of a distinct personage and upon their departure? First thing I'm gonna do though is, y'all know what this is. It's the song of my people. <laughs> and you all know more or less how to hold it. It's secured between your thumb and your forefinger. And this is how you make the noise. I'm not gonna do it tonight because I live in a townhouse and I'd like to continue living in a townhouse. However, on we go. In years gone by when gangways were rather difficult to hook up and uh, the wooden ship's decks were way up there, it wasn't unusual to have senior officers hoisted aboard, either aboard the ship's boat, the jolly boat, or in a chair, specially made for the uh, senior officers. Uh, the only other ways were ladder or a piece of rope. Most of these guys that had attained uh, post captain and up were generally kind of old and rather unfit. So, you know, we hope for a sickly season or a bloody war. Well, a heart attack would qualify too because it opens up a position. Um, therefore, it was necessary to haul these guys up, and calls were given twice. And it's the same one that you've heard, all heard before, the like that, about eight seconds. The first one was when they were lowering, lowering the seat down, ship side, into the boat. You get it down there, and then you do the same pipe to bring it up. Now, the low portion of the pipe designates how long the guys that are handling the falls for this chair are to pull up, to hoist it up. Then the other guys are going to pull it out that way at the high note. And as you go down again, the low note, you lower away. It's the same thing coming up. But there are specific timings. We'll get into them later. Um, nowadays, of course, uh, ships have gangways that are pretty easy to hook up, so you don't have to hoist the old skipper above your head to get him aboard ship. Uh, they can walk. Thanks. Appreciate it. 
but the tradition continues. Now, does anybody have any idea who warrants getting piped aboard? If not, that's cool. It's a rather arcane bunch of people, actually. First of all, and I'm speaking strictly Royal Canadian Navy, Royal Navy, any kind of Commonwealth Navy, uh, Her Majesty. And the following members of the royal family when in uniform. Oddly enough, they have to be wearing a Royal Marines, so that dates back to our time as well, or an RN uniform. Uh, members of the royal family, Navy officers of flag rank, Royal Navy officers in command of a ship or an installation, and foreign naval officers, whatever rank, as long as you're an officer and not a midi, you qualify. And it's a courtesy more than anything. So remember that when we're battling our American brothers, that they weren't being piped aboard, whatever as well. Now, I'm gonna rehash some of the stuff that I gave last time with regards to holding the call and achieving the proper notes. As I showed you before, like, geez, like this. This is the low note position. This is the high note position. That's the low note. Could be better. There. Clamp down on it, choke it, and blow harder. Pretty simple. And really, there's only a couple notes you have to worry about, the high one and the low one. There's trills and warbles, but for piping aboard, you don't worry about those. And if you're going to do this, it, eight seconds doesn't sound like a whole lot of wind. It's more than you might think. Um, if you're not used to it, you might find yourself a little spinny at the end of it, which is not good when you're standing beside Vic or something like that, or Tom, and you're going, not good. Uh, but practice. And as soon as you can get smooth, one breath, low to high to low, you pretty well got it. And you pretty well handle all the regular calls that we would do. Now, I know that uh, soldiers drill, sailors go to sea, but there are certain times when a little uniformity is desirable. And one of those things is when you are piping aboard. <clears throat> when you're making a pipe, you stand at attention with the pipe as you're preparing to do the pipe, you have the call. You're gonna hold it like this. Arm straight out, bent 90 degrees. You're off hand, down by your side and close to. Pretty simple stuff, right? Um, you will never salute while you're in the piping party. And if you take that back to our time when then you would doff caps, you don't doff caps, you leave them on because you're working. Your hand is busy. You can't give a proper salute. Oh, let's see. The position, if you do a piping party, which is usually three guys, three members, three people, whichever, you're supposed to be at right sides to the gangplank. Oh, sorry, did I say gangplank? Gangway. The senior piper, should be on the outside so we can have the best view of where the skipper is coming from. Soon as the skipper comes up, say on the end of the jetty or walks onto the dock, that's when you give the first call. As he's moving along and ready to step aboard, that's when you give the second one. You end the call and if he knows the, the way things are done, It'll come together nicely. You end the call when he first sets foot on the deck. And that would apply to our boats too. Because it's going to take more than eight seconds to get on a boat unless you're Ryan and you can just jump right on. 
I enjoy seeing that actually. Now there are a couple orders as well. All the movements of the piping party should be carried out in order. The senior piper gives the orders. There's the order ready. At ready, you come from that position that I showed you and bring it up. On the order pipe, take your breath and let it, let it go. Do your, do your call. That's, that's all there is, except for one more thing that you will probably never do is called transfer calls. And I'll tell you about it, but don't worry about it. Again, from that position I showed you, the, other, the left arm straight down by your side, bring the right arm to the center of your body, left, right arm goes down, left arm has the call and holds it close to the body. That's it. That's all the drill. That's all the orders. And of course, being shipped on a ship, arm, you're not in the field of glory. You're on the ship of doom that you're gonna bring someone to. Now, with regards to boats, there's another protocol, protocol again, and I'll go through it and I'll go through, I'll read it so I don't mess it up. The first pipe, when you're afloat, as the bow oar is brought inboard or the boat comes alongside is when you start the pipe. In either case, the pipe should have ended by the time there is no way on the boat. Once it's come to a, a stop, the boat is actually alongside, which kind of is counterintuitive, but I imagine there's someone to haul it closer if it has to be, but the boat should have no way on itself, or as soon as that bow oar comes in. Um, is that clear? Yes, no? The second pipe, as the person's uh, coming up the accommodation ladder, or jumping into the boat. The pipe should end the moment the person being piped aboard steps onto the deck. So again, it's kind of a timing dance and the senior officer should be cognizant of the time it takes. If he isn't, maybe someone, your boat's cox and maybe I before all this happens and remind them. That remembering that we're, we're civilians, we don't know everything, but it's nice to know so it so we get that moment that we're looking for when we're, when we're at reenactments. Okay, for going ashore, when someone's leaving the ship or the boat, it's the same thing except reversed. As they're stepping off, you do the call. And as they're reaching the end of whatever predetermined spot it is, be it the end of the dock, the end of the jetty, the second one is given. It's the same pipe, there's no difference. It seems again, kind of useless, but if you look back <clears throat> over history and the, the reasons they were done, they do make sense. Now, I, saw, I think someone was asking about uh, ashore protocols, no? Okay, ashore, it's much the same. Uh, begin the pipe as the person draws near to the unit normally a predetermined point, i.e. the end of the jetty. Or as if you're near a place that has a building or he's walking out of the heads, that's when you do your first call. Pipe, sorry. The second pipe begins as they draw near the gangway. The last part should again coincide with this personage stepping onto the deck. It's simple, but it's a dance. And again, when he leaves, same thing, just reverse it, two pipes. Um, now the timings. <clears throat> if you don't know the timings, it's 12 seconds total. The first two seconds are the low call. So up like this, you're not choking at all. And then slowly over the space of two seconds, choke down and blow harder so you get that more shrill tone. You hold on to that 
for four seconds. It's starting to sound like you're gonna get winded because you will. Uh, two seconds to go back to the lower note and then finish four seconds. And that's it with a sharp finish. Not like I usually tend to do and just go gasping out your last bit of breath, trying to push some air through this little pipe. Slowly work up to it, come across, slow down and finish. It's simple. And there's not anybody among us that couldn't do it. Uh, my <clears throat> breathing capacity is shot. It has been for a while, but I can still do it. It's practice. And if you're a big talker, you've got the practice already. Now, are there any questions? Because we can go rather in depth on this. All right, so I'm going to allow participants to unmute themselves. I will okay. start with the questions that were put into the chat. Okay. What taught the bosun and his mates in the use of the pipes? Were, uh, were there any official instructions for them? No. So we're going to go with os uh, osmosis, right? Well, there were instructions as to when these things happened, but the bosun's call was used throughout the day. So you got used to hearing it. So certain things you would hear normally, but certain other things like piping the side would only be happening on these certain occasions. And the bosun would be teaching the mates how to do it. Matter of fact, the bosun would probably be standing as the primary piper in any kind of party. Or if there was no party, if the ship was too small, he'd be doing the pipe. Is there a pipe for when a senior officer is departing from a ship or vessel? I think you, you did cover that. Yeah, it's, it's the, the same, same process pipe. in reverse, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what or which factors determine the number of personnel piping? I think you said a piping party of three. Yeah, uh, because as you can well imagine, everybody's capacity is different. Their timing might be a little different. Three is about as much as can get it together so it doesn't sound like a, a chorus of scorched cats, to quote, yeah, Dickens. Um, and you'd have to practice. You definitely have to practice in your head or someone counting out to you as you go. Generally speaking, nowadays, you'd have to be an admiral to get a piping party. Um, ship's commander or something like that, you get one because it's easier. And the honor is still the same. And uh, Gerth would like to know if you would be willing to teach this at the May 2022 School of the Sailor. Yourself or Elizabeth? Yeah, either or. Either or. Now, I would tend to go training just on the basic calls. Um, still carry on, general call, um, because wakey wakey or called to dinner or lash and stove, whatever you want. There, that's a lot. And it's a lot to take in and you gotta get the technique first of doing trills and warbles and all that kind of stuff. How's that sound? Sounds good. Sounds and good. incidentally, yes, we are planning a May 2022 event called the School of the Sailor. Uh, Girth Pretty is already putting a lot of work to, together in order to uh, get us a really interesting syllabus. Uh, one question from Bruce, would the army being transported on board a ship be expected to pay respects during the pipe as the ship's captain came on board? Nah. They're not part of the club. Keep them below decks where they belong, out of trouble. All right. It looks like Girth has another question. Yes, Girth. Uh, no, I'm not a sir. I'm a warrant officer like you, so call me Mr. Uh, is there a supplier of bosun's pipes, modern day bosun pipes, that you would suggest or recommend? Acme Whistles and Berry. Oh, okay. Thank you. They have them in nickel, copper too, I think, or stainless. They say the copper tastes great. Yeah. It was a nice color too. Ahead. What would it be? Would it be copper that'd be most appropriate for our time period, or? 
I think you could go with copper or nickel plate. Uh, if you were going earlier than ours, it would be copper. It would be copper and brass, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but with us, yeah, I've used my uh, nickel-plated one ever since. Although I did have a copper one, copper does taste shitty. Uh, you had a question. Carl had a question. Hey, Glendon, um, are you familiar with current um, Canadian Navy uh, boson? Uh, uh, piping aboard and piping ashore practices, and if so, I mean, how that compares to what was practiced in the early 19th, 19th century? What has changed is the frequency of calls and the way the orders are given. Now it's loudspeaker. However, they still give pipes over the loudspeaker. So uh, I, I'm just for perspective, I'm 21 yeah. years retired from the US Navy. and um, so for us, the bosun's whistle, we'll use that, you know, especially, you know, when the skipper comes aboard or goes ashore, mm -hmm. um, but also at changes of command. Um, and we'll have a whole array of what we call side boys mm -hmm. will salute in response to the arrival or departure of the dignitary. And then we'll also have a bell with us that we'll call a stinger. Okay. Um, are, does bell were bells ever playing a role? Um, because the number of ding you'll have the bosun's whistle, but then the number of taps on the bell is that indicates the rank of the individual, be it a wow. flag officer or a, a, the captain of the ship, or you know, as you were talking about those other categories. Royalty Anything like that? Did bells have any role? Okay, um, I grew up in a navy family. My dad was a steward, uh -huh. so had some exposure and honestly the only time I heard the bells ringing was to keep time oh. and for death. Interesting. Uh, piping somebody aboard it was the pipes. Yeah because we we take I mean in U.S. Navy we learn from early on that I mean we take probably 99 percent of all of our traditions from British Royal Navy. So just curious see yeah. if anything how we compare. <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I, you're right with regards to tradition every, everywhere, but when you're a major colonial power, you leave DNA everywhere, right? And uh, yeah, but I think what the US has done is they've made it their own. Huh. Okay. US stuff is US stuff. Even the call, some of the calls that uh, we would use, say, in a sailing vessel are different than you would use on a sailing vessel in the USN to achieve the same job. And uh, alluding to your earlier question there of with regards to how much of the pipes actually have pipes blown, again, there's no neat reason for really haul away or lash and stow, which is called wakey wakey up here. Um, some of the other ones, you know, for, for hanging, don't often use them as far as I know. But uh, yeah, um, if you're really interested, I will find out. I'll do some digging and see if, uh, no? I can do some digging and find out uh, if there was ever bells. But to my knowledge, uh, limited as it is, uh, deaths, time, and for baptizing babies. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. No problem. And just building on Carl's question from uh, Commander Wan, uh, was there any distinction during the War of 1812 between what the British service did and the US service did? Okay, that I can't answer with any certainty at all, um, but I'm going to assume that it was even closer than it would be now. Uh, a lot of the orders were the same. A lot of the people in the USN were British sailors. And I imagine a lot of the upper deck and the middle deck were you know, gun room guys were uh, ex-British or had trained US sailors in the ways and means, teach them the rope, right? Teach them the ropes. But I can't say with any certainty, but I would imagine they're much the same. Uh, there's people that know much more about the comparisons than I do. Is that good enough? You're mute. Great. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Hovey? 
and you don't have to limit yours. <laughs> hey, uh, Glennon, um, is there, did you happen to mention whether there was any guidance or instruction, you know, that, that governs uh, the bosun's calls or the piping, you know, for this particular time period, you know, for the early 1800s? Is there such a thing? Like the gunnery practice was, wasn't put out until 17, for example. Yeah. Okay, the research that I have done, uh, most of it had to do with giving orders on deck. And that would be as casual and as necessary as it would happen in modern day. That man there, mind yourself, or piping the still, or there's this other little one, beep, 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 beep. It was just, just to get someone's attention. It has no particular name. Um, and, you know, the Holloway, Heave, all these things. It had double meanings, too, because there's only so much you can do on a call. That in this situation, it means this. Say if you're doing boat work. If you're hauling up sail or something like that, it means this. So there, are, there is a bit of duplication because it's hard to keep them all straight in your head without getting a good lashing now and then. Yeah, and you know, so was the thing. But uh, I can find out more. And you know what? You've kind of spurred me to want to find out more. Yeah, so we, we, we've always got our, our primary source, um, you know, the, uh, the Articles of War. And the, um, there's another couple of manuals that Doug up, can't remember the names of them now, but uh, uh, I'm wondering if there is some sort of, of manual out there for this kind of thing. I know that the lower decks didn't have a lot of resources because most of them couldn't read, but it'd be interesting to, to find something that, that was instructive in this regard. Yeah, um, never mind reading, even speaking English wasn't a common thing. Well, most of it did, but that's one of the other reasons to use uh, the bosun's call is everybody understands a whistle once you tell them and everybody can hear it because some guys' voices just don't carry through the wind and what have you, or they're not piercing enough. But uh, I'm inclined to think, and again, it's just me thinking out loud, that as far as standardization went, when you signed on to the RN, you signed on for a voyage. About 15, 20 years later, you got your pay but you didn't go back out necessarily on the same ship or on a Navy ship at all. You might be Navy this voyage and merchant the next. And again, you're opening up differences between both arms of essentially a seagoing nation, or even if you're in revenue or the smuggling duty, whatever, things might be a little different. So I'm inclined to think that while the basic tenets remain the same, and I don't know if they were dictated, things were a little more organic. And if you signed on, oh, you were on victory this voyage and indomitable this voyage, you took that knowledge with you and it spread virally, shall we say? Does that make sense to anybody? And I'm seriously asking. It's, it's interesting in a lot of the, uh, the army literature, there are privately published books by uh, middle ranking and, and high ranking officers about how to do the manual of arms and the drill and all that, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And then there was stuff that was published by horse guards, which was direct from the crown. Uh, for the Navy, I've only ever seen really high level documents like the Articles of War and things like that, um, which gave direction to the officers only and, and I've never seen anything that was particularly directed towards any of the middle management or the common seamen. Um, so it'd be interesting if anything like that turns up. I know that, again, there's some diaries out there uh, by the in individual seamen that you can, you can pull and use as a reference to see what you know, they were thinking. But I, I think Glennon's right that a lot of it was just uh, trained by rote and, and in-person training. I don't think there was a lot of literature um, another question that you have, uh, we have for you here, are there any additional sources, maybe modern sources, 
that the reenactment co co community could uh, could access. Patrick O'Brien, of course. Um, Bill mentioned Victorian sources, and that's when the pages start to pile up. There's the young officer's sheet anchor. There's um, guidance for POs and young officers and how to look after their men. I have some copies and it's good advice. It's, it's very paternal. It's not what you think about, uh, you know, the cat being used every second day and stuff like that. It's more like, get to know your men by their first name. Ask them how things are going with their wives and family. Build a relationship with them. And you know what? It sounds cynical, but that's the way to get people to die for your country. Well, the point of war is to make the other guy die for his. Well, yeah, and you want to stay alive, but you got to put yourself in jeopardy to do it. I mean, no one dies for king and country on your side. You die for each other. And it's those personal relationships that do it. Um, off on a tangent there. But uh, as far as the communications, flags, of course, standardize more or less. Um, you had a system before, Hume system. You had his thereafter, and it was pared down and pared down because there was something like 200 flags or something like that. And then it was pared down more or less to what we have now post-war. And that's what we use now. Um, it'd be nice to teach Hume stuff, but since we do sail in the real world, I think it would be pointless and maybe dangerous. Other All right, well, we'll um, we're coming up against our, our time block here. I just want to mention uh, the next presentation will be March 24th. We'll be presenting the life of a midshipman with our midshipman, Ray Tesani, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, let's all thank Glendon for this, this particularly interesting and, and very specific presentation because it's these, these little details that we really should be uh, getting more into as as presentation to the public when we do our reenactments. I know um, Psyche has actually piped aboard, uh, what, what's his, uh, Captain Bibby. Uh, we've actually piped him aboard and uh, a few others. So certainly something that that adds to the flavor of our, our, our group. So thanks everyone for attending. Really appreciate you coming out. We'll see you on the we'll be 24th. We'll these too. What's that? Oh yes, um, yeah. So we'll have some speaking notes posted up on, on the event page. Uh, everybody stay safe and maintain a positive psyche. Ooh. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Good presentation, Glendon. Oh, thank you very much. Enjoy my it. tongue Learned got working. Okay. Learned a lot. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thanks Bye. a lot for your questions, Carl. Thanks, Bill.